Well, welcome to our home. This is actually a very special room in the house. It's uh, our octagon bear room, actually. Uh, today, we're going to be shooting and learning a little bit more about this brake barrel uh, Black Ops 22 caliber air rifle. But before I get into that, and as long as I'm here in the bear room, let me just share a few things with you. I went to Admiralty Island, Alaska. I had a, uh, a great guide who taught me how to find this particular brown grizzly bear. And uh, it was a, a 10 day hunt. We got him on the last day. I've got a picture here that kind of shows you what it was like on that day when I used a 338 Magnum and brought him down with three rounds with a very big bullet that travels over 3,000 feet a second. But I wanted safety and having the right gun for the right job was it. They actually call that the Alaskan caliber. Uh, this was one picture. Uh, here's another without the guide. But again, I would never have been able to find this grizzly bear without him. Admiralty Island is the place today to get a grizzly bear. Uh, if you'll remember, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was our president who was known to be a bear hunter. He loved hunting bears. And he often went out on bear hunts, Wyoming, Montana, Alaska, you name it. He'd find them and, and hunt them. Uh, a woman wrote him one day after seeing his picture in the paper with the bear, and she said, I'm making a stuffed bear. Would you mind if, if I name it a teddy bear? He said, no problem. He probably should have asked for a nickel or a dime per bear, but he didn't. And she made a lot of bears and finally sold her business to the ideal toy company, who then made a whole bunch of bears, and teddy bears are made today none of which provided a royalty to the Roosevelt family. But that's a little background about that. Behind me, we've got uh, some, some stuffed animals that I've shot or trapped along the way. Uh, over against the far left, you'll see an otter. They swim around in Alaska. They're a lot of fun. That second one is actually kind of unusual. That's a silver fox. You don't come across them often. And the rarest of all is the third one. That's a cross fox, meaning one parent was red and one parent was silver. And so it wasn't a red fox, it wasn't a silver, it was a cross. And it doesn't happen often, but it happened out in Wyoming for me. There in the middle is a badger. All badgers are mean. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're considered a cousin to the wolverine. And uh, Michigan has made that wolverine name famous. That's one mean animal I want you to know. And this is his smaller cousin. Uh, up to the far right is a possum. But often in taxidermy they don't put certain tails in a rat tail that a possum has is not included. And next to them is a beaver. And there again is where tails aren't done often by taxidermy cost more than the rest of the animal. So I have those two without tails. Ah, and there's my buddy Hollowhead. There in the center. Hollowhead, you do anything to work into a picture. Hollowhead's my partner here on these videos. I got him at a circus. He was shot out of a cannon and landed in my lap. He's, he's ugly, <laughs> but I don't mind. He's part of our team here and at least he doesn't smoke anymore. While I'm here in the Buffalo room, let me just share a few pieces of Indian artifacts. Here's a, a tribe of a scout tri from the tribe chasing antelope in, in Wyoming, as it turns out. That's, that's the Comanche territory. That's the group of Indians that beat General Custer. And next to them here is a buffalo head and uh, you know, Americans like to put them in bleach and turn these skulls pure white. Uh, the Indians don't do that. 
So you really have still some of the original markings from that buffalo uh, on him. This uh, dream catcher is interesting because when uh, missionaries went into the uh, Indian tribes to, to Christianize them, they had one problem, and that's with replacing the dream catcher. These Indians had had these dream catchers hanging outside the opening of their houses, their tents, whatever, since birth, and they kept bad dreams from coming in. So they weren't ready to give up the dream catcher under any circumstances. And so I'm told that Christian missionaries said, well, you know, in the movies, how you hold a cross up and keep Dracula away from you, uh, you know, something like this, uh, they brought that into sewing a cross right into the center of that dream catcher. And the combination of Christ and a dream catcher really kept the bad dreams out of their tents. Here's uh, just one of their uh, uh, dance uh, pieces uh, using the foot of a, uh, an eagle, the head of an eagle. And uh, above it here is a hunting party working its way silently through some snowy woods. Not too much like we have outside right now. Uh, here's a carving out of a piece of wood. They love the bear. And he was the most powerful animal out there. And so they carved a bear out of this stone. These are just some of the folklore I enjoy when I go out west hunting. Well, let's find out what this Black Ops assault looking rifle can do for us. First of all, we have to have the right ammunition. And this particular rifle comes in 17 caliber and 22. I have both. Today we're going to shoot the 22. Here's a nice pellet pen from Air Venturi. Kind of nice to stick it in your pocket if you're out hunting. And then all you do is click it to put pellets into a brake barrel rifle. Today I'm going to be using uh, some exact Jumbo Diablos. Heavy duty. Because they make the loudest noise on these targets of mine. This is a, uh, a brake barrel. And the way you load these is you have to break the barrel. And that's the start. This gun has a 44 pound pressure to cock. <clears throat> a drawback on brake barrels is that the barrel isn't that long. It starts here in the middle of a rifle and runs just down into this moderator, which quiets the round. From the top, we take these pellets and push them in one at a time so it's flush, and then we cock it back. <clears throat> when this particular rifle is cocked, it automatically sets the safety which is a second trigger right in there. And to make it so I can fire it, I now have to push that forward trigger even more forward. I can certainly use the bipod on the front, but in this example, I'm just gonna use the sand rest in front of me. 65 yards away, says my range finder, is our middle ground target. We have one down below here that's about 15, 20 yards. And at the far end of the pond, we have an 85 yard range. Well, we're gonna be shooting at the 65 yard range today with all this snow on the ground. And let's uh, uh, take a look down there. I'll describe to you what we're looking at. On the far left, you'll see an old gargoyle made out of cement. I painted it black so that I could see where I was hitting on it, and we've hit it a few times. 
These were put around castles, you know, to keep the peasants away. As we continue right, we see some frying pans. I think that'll be my first target today. Uh, just to the right again is a, a bear made out of a stump, and I don't have him set up, so we'll ignore him today. Keeping to the right, we have my uh, critter hole target, which is made of two pieces of steel. First of all, a big slab of steel, an inch thick, and when we shoot it, it's barely audible. But if I can shoot in that hole, in effect doing a heart shot, I can go through that hole and I can hit the saw blades on the back side and they make a real clang. And then I know I've shot that critter in the heart. Uh, then we've got a few more targets to the right, a couple of pipes and a couple of spinner targets. And I think our first target today will be that bottom frying pan near the ground. That's the first one. There's the second. There's the third one. Now that little frying pan on top, I don't think it's got but about a four inch bottom plate to it. It's 65 yards. And there's number four. At the top of that stump is uh, an old cowbell to the left of the stump. Let's see if we can hit it. Okay. And that's one cowbell that's been hit. Next thing we're going to do is try to shoot the heart out of a critter down there. We'll know if the saw blades bang. Got him in the heart. To the right of that uh, uh, saw blade, uh, we have a couple of pipes that I welded on a plate vertical. Probably filled with snow this morning but we'll see if they don't sound like a chime when I shoot at them. Before we get into the specifications of the Black Ops rifle, what's good and bad about it, uh, I thought I'd share my knife collection with you. I've been a knife dealer for probably 35 years and somehow I got into it by accident. This whole group up here is the hibiscus uh, switchblades, which are now legal in a dozen states, including our state of Michigan. Um, and uh, they've always been legal in a collection by a knife dealer, and that's what I've had. Uh, but all of these are uh, such knives. This is a Russian uh, Kalashnikov. And this is designed by the very guy who designed the AK-47, if you will. One of my favorite knife collections here is a uh, African uh, uh, professional hunter series called, in this case, the Serengeti Plains. And this is the uh, big Cape Buffalo, also called uh, uh, Black Death. And uh, I've got the big five African animals on there. Of course, you might want a, just a good old paperweight on your desk. Um, this is uh, not a switchblade, it's a Smith & Wesson, but it's got the dagger blade on the end. And uh, because of its thumb screw opening, you can just open it with your thumb that way. A host of other uh, military SWAT team, SEAL team knives. Then uh, down here is just a combination of knives and throwing stars. Here's uh, some sort of a, of a uh, what do you call it, uh, 
the uh, Scorpion. And he was made just by knife parts at a knife factory. And uh, obviously the workers there didn't have enough to do. Uh, a lot's done to make a knife lighter than ever before. Uh, this has what's called a liner lock right in here. And it also has the uh, bayonet blade. But uh, here is a knife that can open up, if you're used to it, uh, quite quickly and a lot of holes, doing everything it can to keep that knife light. I was outside a, uh, a pawn shop when a woman came in and the owner of the pawn shop didn't want to buy her knife set, but she had a baby with her and they were hungry and uh, they needed to sell this. I think it came out of the Franklin Mint at about $39 a piece. I paid her half of that price and she sold the whole collection to me and headed to the grocery store. Uh, a number of other knives here. You can see uh, Browning made some knives, um, at, not Browning but Beretta, and they even carved out of the blade doing everything they can to make it light. Because you see, when a knife is heavy, people quit carrying them. A number of Italian stilettos are down here. And these have uh, uh, not only a lock up here and a, a button, but they have this lock here so that you can't open it in your pants. But pull that back, and now she opens up. Here's a, another sci-fi knife. These knives are designed and often used in science fiction movies, if you will. Some knives, like this one here, uh, don't have a button on them. But uh, they are switchblades. They do have a spring. If somebody asked you, you'd say, no, there's no spring here. It does have a thumb lock. But uh, this is not a switchblade. But a closer look shows that this entire grilled piece here is a rocker panel. Oh, I need to open it more often. But by pushing that, she opens that up. Uh, down in Mexico, they have their own version of switchblades. No button, but when you pull this lanyard, she opens up just fine. Uh, down below, I have a number of the uh, Leatherman type tools. Uh, and here is another sci-fi knife right here. And I don't know what movie this was in. I'm sure some viewers here do. But I have to tell you, just holding this thing sends power right up my right arm. It obviously would make you capable of holding off a half a dozen men, if you will. Uh, as just one example of the many knives that are showing up in movies these days. Well, we can spend more and more time on knives another day. What I really need to do is talk to you about the strengths and weaknesses of this Black Ops break barrel rifle. First of all, note that it's not a Springer. A Springer rifle has a spring in it, much like the old Daisy Red Riders, etc. And if you left them cock, that compressed spring could lose power. Today they're making those springs out of better and better steel so that doesn't happen. But they haven't quite licked that problem. This is not a Springer. This is a brake barrel. And in a brake barrel, we have a piston. I think Benjamin made them famous with this uh, thing called a, a, a nitro piston. But uh, a piston nonetheless. And when you cock this barrel, you are cocking that piston, and you can leave the gun cocked for several days, I'm told. I don't do that, but some do. And it doesn't hurt the piston at all. I bought this gun after I found out the specs on it, and I bought two of them, one in 17 caliber, one in 22. Now let me show you a shortcoming. The barrel starts right here where my finger is. That's where it breaks, and it ends right here. This barrel is only 11 inches long. The 22 caliber actually has a moderate modulator here that silences the gun. The 17 caliber does not. So the 17 caliber is noisier than the 22 caliber. These are very real um, bipods made of steel. They do work. 
I do like them. Uh, some people say, well, they got a little wobble in them. That didn't seem to bother me when I was aiming. Um, it does have an adjustable cheek piece here. And like all my rifles, I keep some notes here on the side of my cheek so I know right where to aim and, and when to aim. It comes with an absolute lousy scope, a 4x32. And I, I just have a rule in my head, if the gun comes with a scope, it's a bad scope. They shouldn't do that. So you have to go out and get a good scope. And that's what I've done. Uh, this one here is a, a 4x16. And uh, it's a 44 end. It also has the adjustable objective lens, what we call AOL. And you want to make an adjustment there as much as you want to make an adjustment here. Double screws. And here's something that, that differentiates the PCP rifles with the pneumatic uh, compressed air uh, with a Springer or a brake barrel. And that is that Springers and brake barrels shake every time they go off and they can loosen the screws of a scope. They can loosen the screws of the whole doggone gun in time. That's how much of a shake. You can buy a $500 scope and it'll ruin it if it's the brake barrel, nitro piston, or Springer type rifles. Uh, you need a scope designed for, for air. They're actually made better than uh, the real expensive ones. I've had expensive ones and I've looked through them on the 150th shot and found the crosshairs laying in the bottom of the scope. That's an expensive moment in your life. Um, there's a nice hidden compartment down here in the magazine where I can carry some tools, some Allen wrenches, and some uh, extra pellets, if I will. It has a fake bolt on it, which only makes it look like a PCP rifle, but it is not. Um, what else I can say about the gun uh, is this. It's made in China. A lot of people criticize that. And now let me say something good about it. It's about $180. I think, underline the word think, I think the nitro piston in this gun, the, the piston, is a nitro piston XL made in China, I think. Because this gun has the specs, in my shooting experience, of the Benjamin XL a nitro piston air gun. That gun is $280 to $340. It's claimed to be the most expensive uh, and highest velocity and most powerful brake barrel rifle they are. And yet I was able to get it for 180. Some of these wholesalers that give you 10% off, that brings it down to about 160. For about $160, so that's a great buy with the power. Make no mistake, this is not a toy. <laughs> this is one powerful gun. And as you'll recall, our mission statement talks about safety. And you want to be very, very careful. These guns can kill you. Uh, they can put a pellet through you. They put a pellet through an old muskrat. So well, be very, very careful when you're using them uh, and, and treat them just like they're a real powder gun, if you will. Uh, other than that, I've enjoyed this and the, the, the one in 17 caliber. The 17 caliber, I don't use a lot, and here's why. This shoots a 22 caliber pellet at 1,000 feet a second. Remember now, at 1,050, we break the speed of sound, and you pick up that sound, which really makes these guns noisy and gets the neighbors all shook up. So we stay under the speed of sound. You have plenty of power at 1,000 feet a second. But when you get into the 17 caliber, all of a sudden this thing wants to shoot at 1,200, 1,400, 1,500 feet per second. Now, if you're out somewhere in the wilderness and you don't mind that noise, go right ahead. Uh, but there's a, a couple of things. We're making noise now, and uh, I have to use the heaviest pellets of possible to get that 17 caliber to shoot low and to not make that noise. I want to remain backyard friendly. But I'll tell you something else. Pellets have a little cup in the back, like a parachute, if you will. And as it goes down that barrel, that little cup helps propel it down that barrel. 
When you go over 950, 980 feet a second, what happens is it gets out there in front of that rifle and it's got so much power it begins to wobble. And now we got a problem with accuracy. I've seen some zoom right on up into the sky and some plow down into the lake and water below me. Uh, I don't like that. It, it fusses with my accuracy. I think you're only as good as the rifle is accurate. And so I try to stay away from those. Shooting those platinum lightweight rounds just makes it crazier. So stay with heavy pellets. Stay under a thousand feet a second. And uh, check those skirts out. That's one of my accuracy tips. I, I shot competitively. And you need to make sure that that skirt remains round. You'd be shocked at how just some jangling around in the tin can and those skirts can get flat on one side. That does not help accuracy. So make sure you check out your pellets. Some even take a scale for postage and weigh them to make sure that they're all exactly the same weight. Um, you'll find a lot of zingers, if you will, uh, if you buy cheap pellets. The more expensive ones are heavier and uh, more uniform in weight and in that skirt diameter. And that's what I try to stay with. I hope we helped you today.